Hi folks, do please turn to page 1095 in the Red Bibles. Our reading is Acts chapter 3 from verse 11 on page 1095. I'll pray for us before we read. Lord God, thank you that you are a speaking God and thank you that your words don't just inform us about you but they change us. Uh, please, in your kindness, change us this evening. Amen. Acts chapter 3 from verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, does, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and no was made strong. It is, G it is Jesus. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed to you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Thanks, James. Please keep Acts chapter 3 open, um, and you can read along with us as we go through it. We're picking up in the middle of this sermon. We started last week, and we'll be looking mainly from verse 17 um, this week. I should say, my name's Robbie. If we've not met before, it's great to have you with us this evening. Particularly welcome if you're joining us. And we began last week as we thought about this miracle that Peter performs at the beginning of chapter 3 when he heals a lame man who waits beside the temple, and then the sermon that he delivers off the back of it. We began thinking about that whole topic of utopias, the longing that we have deep down for things to be put right, and the way that different expressions of that have been kind of have happened or, or um, have been tried or experimented with in human history. We have a deep, deep longing for things to be put right, and that is in some ways what this sermon's about. Just have a look at verse 21. Talking about Jesus, Peter says, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Putting everything right is what Jesus is all about, according to Peter. And the healing that we saw last week was a little sign of that. Just like the lame man's bones were brought back to life, uh, were kind of joined back together and his muscles were recuperated and he jumped to his feet and leapt around in excitement. So Jesus is one day going to restore all things. But when Peter stands up to explain everything, his first point is like a hammer blow to the head. Look back down at verse 15. He lays in with the accusation to the watching crowd. You want to understand all this, you've got to realize it's Jesus. You killed him. Verse 15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We're witnesses of this. It's by faith in Jesus, the one that you guys killed, that this man walks. 
And so you can imagine, right, the next logical step as he's explained all this stuff, okay, Jesus is coming to restore all things, that the, the healing is a sign of Jesus' restoration of all things. You guys messed up in a big, big way by killing the author of life. And the most logical thing for him to say next is, you're not invited to the party when it comes. Jesus is coming back to put all things right. And the most logical thing is for humans to be excluded. But that is not what we get. With Jesus, there is always a way back. If the sermon kind of starts with an accusation, what it moves on to is a beautiful invitation and then finally a warning. And we'll look at those two things in turn. Peter's invitation, this is verse 17 through 21. Verse 17, now fellow Israelites, literally brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. It's a much gentler tone. Look, guys, I know you didn't think he was God when you killed him. I get it. I know that you feel kind of bad about it now. I mean, it's a natural response, although it's not going to let you off the hook. But, verse 18, this is how God fulfilled what he'd foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. At work through your evil actions, Peter's saying, God was there to bring about his will. Jesus' death is not some accident or some misstep. His death on the cross is not God thinking, oh, I wonder what I can do to make the most out of this bad situation. I know, I'll play the resurrection card. I've not played the resurrection card in a while. No, Jesus' death and resurrection is God's plan since the very beginning. And one of the things that Peter wants to do in this little sermon is to expand our view of Jesus. What's going on with Jesus is always way more than you thought there was. It's like when you, this is a silly illustration, but it's like in Cambridge, if you've ever had that, this experience, of meeting someone who's incredibly clever, okay, they've got some PhD in some really complicated field of science or something like that, but as well as that, a few weeks later, you discover that they're absolutely brilliant at sport, they like represented their county under 18s or something like that, and then they're really, really, really good at a musical instrument as well. That happens all the time, and it's kind of annoying, isn't it? It's a bit like that with Jesus. I mean, it's a silly illustration, but there's always more to see. We've already had the fact that he's the Messiah the promised anointed one from the Old Testament. We've already had the fact that he's the Lord, the one who's ascended to God's right hand and who reigns over all things. We've already had the fact that he is the author of life. And in this last little bit of the sermon, Peter gives us a kind of whistle-stop tour of some of the greats of the Old Testament to show us even more. Just scan through and notice how much he's referring to the Old Testament. Verse 18, you get all the prophets... Verse 21, you get the holy prophets again. Verse 24, all the prophets, beginning with Samuel. Verse 25, you've got more about the prophets as well. Picture it like a kind of bucket or a stuff sack with Jesus affixed to it. And slowly we're filling it as we read through the book of Acts with all sorts of stuff about him that just blows our mind. What Peter's doing is trying to stuff more and more into who Jesus is until in our minds he's a little bit bigger and in our hearts he's just a little bit greater, more like he actually is in reality. But there's one idea, Old Testament idea, in Acts 3 which looms large. Jesus is God's suffering servant. That's how he begins the sermon. Look at verse 13, Um, God has glorified his servant Jesus, and it's how he ends it as well, verse 26, when God raised up his servant. And that word, even though, you know, he doesn't actually quote from the book of Isaiah, it's like a little hyperlink. You click it, and with it comes all of the expectation in that great book of the Old Testament about what God's servant would be like. Isaiah is a book that's serious about human sin, but is also full of the hope of God's mercy and forgiveness. And it lands on this one character, the servant. Chapter 52, verse 13. My servant will act wisely. He'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And we read there about a figure who's despised and rejected, a man of suffering who's familiar with pain, who's punished by God, who's pierced and crushed and oppressed and afflicted. 
and yet who turns out to be the great saviour of the people. The Messiah is actually the one who suffers, Peter says. And his invitation, what comes next, is built on this and all that it achieves. The invitation's there. Recognize who Jesus is, verse 19, and repent. Now, we need to do a bit of work, I think, to understand this word, repent, because I don't know in our culture, but I reckon it's pretty offensive to say repent. We think of the guy with the placard on the street. Don't tell me what to do. Don't be so judgy. Or maybe it's just a kind of incomprehensible thing. It doesn't really make sense to repent in a culture that makes an idol out of living for yourself, where the taglines are no regrets, or you only live once, or just be yourself. And I get that. If repentance is a kind of vague, general sense of guilt about yourself, then the only people who repent are those who haven't completely discovered themselves or mastered their lives or who do somehow have regrets. For the playboy Cambridge poet from a few hundred years ago, Lord Byron, he said, the weak alone repent. And if that's how you view repentance, then you kind of understand that. But for Jesus and his followers, repentance, the call to repent is so much more. To repent is the essence of good news. I wonder if you thought about it like that. The gateway to true joy. The key to life as it's meant to be lived. It's no surprise that when the gospel writers try and sum up Jesus' teaching in one sentence, they all pretty much go for this. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. In other words, if you're going to put it a bit more in an Acts 3 kind of way, the restoration of all things is coming. In spite of what you've done, you're invited. Make sure you're on board. Because repentance, it literally means to turn around, to change one's mind, or to rethink yourself and your relationship with God, to realize who Jesus is, how you've treated him, and to change. It's the realization that that path of being myself is actually one that you don't necessarily want to take to its natural end. We saw this a bit last week as we were thinking about that phrase, you killed the author of life. The thing is that left to our own devices, we're not quite as good as we think we are. When you go down to the cellar, the rats are there. I saw an interview in the paper this weekend of a um, a British actor who'd had quite a tricky start to life. And in his life, he'd been involved in violence and drugs and drink and things like that before he kind of was 18, 19. And the interviewer asked this question. Did you fall, like, help me to understand this. Did did you fall into the wrong crowd of people? But the guy's answer was incredibly honest. He said, no, I was the wrong people. It's a beautifully honest thing to say, isn't it? Repentance starts with that, fronting up to the reality of our own sin. You killed the author of life. But it doesn't end there. It ends with the sweet embrace of a loving God. Look at verse 19 again. Repent then and turn to God. And I love how Peter doesn't just leave it there, kind of hanging in the ether. What follows are three very compelling reasons to turn away from sin and to Jesus Christ. Three blessings or fruits that come from repentance. Let's go through them in turn. Verse 19, the first one, is forgiveness of sins. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. It's a beautiful little phrase. And it conveys complete obliteration and destruction of sin. Deleted. This isn't just kind of hidden away in the recycling bin or a kind of archive folder that you've slightly forgotten where it is in your computer. This is permanently deleted, forever, wiped from the hard drive with no trace left at all. 
Luke doesn't spend ages on the mechanism of how God deals with sin in the book of Acts. He actually spends a bit more time on it in his first book, the Gospel of Luke. And he assumes, I think, that you're picking up these Isaiah references. But elsewhere, Peter, the author of this sermon, will spell it out. Just, if you're taking notes, read 1 Peter 2, verse 24, or 3, verse 18. He says, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. I mean, you see how it works, don't you? Jesus, the innocent sufferer, takes our sin on the cross and dies in our place so that we might live. The only way to healing and forgiveness is through the wounds of Jesus Christ on your behalf. There's actually, I think, if you're looking really carefully, a little allusion to this swap in what Peter said already. Do you remember how, in verse 14, just glance back at it, he said that you guys disown the holy righteous one and ask that a murderer be released to you. He's talking about the criminal, Barabbas, that was literally swapped in for Jesus on the cross. We, by nature, are the kind of people that kill the author of life. We're murderers deserving of judgment. But what happens when murderers are confronted with Jesus on the cross. They get released. It's a beautiful little picture of the swap, isn't it? But forgiveness is not the only benefit of repentance. That's just the very beginning. He moves on, verse 19, to talk about the times of refreshment that come from the Lord. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins will be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. It's a lovely little line. I think it's talking about a present reality that believers can experience when they know that their sins are forgiven. The positive counterpart, I guess. Because there is something deeply refreshing about knowing that your sins are wiped away, isn't there? There's um, the Disney film, The BFG. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Um, it's, I can't, it came out a couple of years ago with the live action version and stuff with Mark Rylance. Um, they add something that's not there in the original Roald Dahl books. One time, Sophie, the main character, catches a nightmare. And the BFG looks at it and says, that is it's the worst kind of nightmare. and tries to catch it up. And she asks, well, what's it about? And he says, you look at what you've done in this dream, and there is no forgiveness. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Pretty heavy for a Disney-rated PG film. To find yourself facing up to something that you have, in fact, done wrong, that cannot be undone, that perhaps hurt you or someone that you love, and something that you alone are responsible for, that's heavy. And then to discover that there is no forgiveness. I mean, that is the literal definition of hell. One of the um, the writers in the Old Testament in Psalm 32 describes this feeling in vivid imagery. My bones are groaning. My strength is sapped like on a really hot day. As one person puts it, if you bottle up sin in your soul, it'll eventually leak out like an acid and eat away at your bones. Unconfessed, unrepentant sin is like a festering sore. You could ignore it for a while, but not forever. I wonder if that's something you can relate to. But then the psalmist goes on. And as he does, you can almost feel the relief washing over him. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I didn't cover up my iniquity. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. It's a beautifully simple little line, but it speaks of so much refreshment, doesn't it? It is such a relief to know the forgiveness of sins, to know your sins are wiped away. It's like a cool drink of water on a scorching hot day. It's like a a, a cooling oil on a sore on your skin. And it doesn't stop there. The blessings of repentance. Verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything 
as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. The healing of the beggar was just a little foretaste of what is coming for those who are connected to Jesus. Right now he's ascended into heaven until one day he returns again to put everything right, to restore all things, literally to put things back together, everything back in order. And it is a constant refrain in the Old Testament, this hope of something uh, of things put right. We looked last week very briefly at Isaiah chapter 35, where it says the lame leap like a deer. Earlier in that chapter, there's another beautiful image used for this restoration of all things. It talks about a dry and arid desert that suddenly blooms with flowers and life. And you might have seen them in the, in the last few weeks that in California, they have this phenomenon in California called the super bloom, where in some of the kind of areas of the Californian desert, if you get the right sort of conditions and um, rains and, and flash floods or whatever, um, then this is just swathes of beautiful poppies and, and plants and colors and things like that. And, and tourists flock and see it and, think, and stuff like that. Apparently the seeds, some of the seeds can lie in wait for 70 years before they germinate. It's a beautiful picture. Or think in the prophets of the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel chapter 37. He looks out and sees a bunch of skeletons, lifeless corpses, and then the spirit breathes life. They assemble, they're fleshed, and they stand up and live and walk. This picture of the the restoration of all things. I guess what they have in common is a picture of resurrection life after death, a picture of hope in the face of what we can imagine as is the worst thing ever. And exa- actually, that's exactly what's an offer in Peter's sermon as well. Just scan ahead. We'll see this a bit more next week. This is the sermon that kicks off opposition to the church. And the thing that got the, um, the kind of Sadducees and the temple authorities and stuff cross was verse 2, chapter 4. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching people Proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. It's not explicitly there in chapter 3, but that is what is meant by the restoration of all things. The promise of scripture is that one day he will fix everything. Because in his death he's dealt with our sin and its consequences forever. And in his new life he rises to bring all those who trust him to that same newness of life. It is those two things that mean that one day he will wipe every tear, deal with every sadness, and fix every broken heart. Like thread attached to a needle and punched through and pulled through with it, Jesus' death paves the way for our life. Oh, how we long for this, don't we? And wouldn't that beggar have longed for it? Just imagine every day for 40 years waiting in the temple as people passed him again and again and again. Just think of those throughout history or in our church who've experienced unimaginable suffering and pain. We talked about the tech utopias and the billions poured into healthcare and making the world a better place. It's not a misplaced desire. Well, it is a misplaced, it's not a wrong desire. It's just misplaced if we see it outside of Jesus. We want it, but it can only come through him, his death and resurrection, his restoration of all things. So that's the invitation. Repent and turn to God and see the blessings that flow from repentance. In the last few verses, Peter issues a bit of a warning. Verse 22 through 26. Now, all the way through, he's been expanding our view of Jesus. And here in this little appendix, he goes really quick fire through a celebrity A-list of Old Testament greats. Verse 22, Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me. You must listen to everything he says. Verse 24, Samuel and all the prophets have spoken, foretold these days. And verse 25, Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Look, Peter's saying, this is the one who was promised from the very beginning. The hope even of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. He's stuffing more and more things about Jesus into that bucket. It's now full to bursting. And the implication is clear. The warning. Don't miss out. Don't miss 
the chance to turn to him. If he's the prophet like Moses, then listen to what he says. If he's the offspring of Abraham, then receive his promised blessing. Verse 26, he's speaking first to Jewish people with the expectation that this message is going to go out to the ends of the earth. And the idea is, look, if you don't get on board now, you're going to miss out. You've got a sneak preview. This message is going to the ends of the earth. Turn to Christ. And so there really is only one imperative. It's a kind of one-point sermon. And it's there in verse 19. Repent and turn to God. How does it connect with us? Well, it might be that there are some people here who are exploring Christianity, thinking a bit about the claims of Jesus Christ, and you're so welcome if that's you and you're joining us this evening. Do you realize, though, that this gospel, this message, it's not automatic? The good news of Christianity is a free gift of salvation and forgiveness for those who do not deserve it. There is nothing that you can do to earn his favor, but you must receive it by turning in repentance and faith. If that's you, repent and turn to God. It may be that there's some here for whom there's been a particular thing that's been eating you up over the past week or even longer. Perhaps some unconfessed struggle or sin. Slowly you've been realizing that this is something that you cannot ignore, like the acid seeping out. But if that's you, the invitation's there. Repent and turn to God for forgiveness and for refreshment. Or maybe it's just that generally in your Christian life, it's been a bit of, bit of a rut. You don't feel like you're making much progress. You're not really feeling it at all. Just plodding, getting by. But if that's you, the invitation is there. This is the path to true joy in the Christian life. Repent and turn to him. Some of you will have seen that the American pastor, Tim Keller, passed away this weekend. I love what he says about the topic of repentance. He says this, in religion, the purpose of repentance is basically to keep God happy so he'll continue to bless you and answer your prayers, which has a kind of knock-on effect. It means that religious repentance is selfish, self-righteous, and bitter all the way to the bottom. But in the gospel, he says, the purpose of repentance is to repeatedly tap into the joy of knowing God in Christ. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Which makes sense then when you think about Martin Luther, the great reformer, who nailed those 95 theses about Christianity to the door of a cathedral in order to start the Reformation. And do you know what the first one was? All of life is repentance. Repentance. If repentance is just a sort of vague sense of guilt, then that sounds like the worst thing ever. <laughs> but if it is to return to the author of life for forgiveness and for refreshment and for renewal and for participation in the restoration of all things, then that is the best news in the world. The only way to live. And not only that, the only way to experience joy as a Christian and to make sure that we get to the end. So as we close, have you discovered the refreshing joy of life-giving repentance? I want to close with a prayer. It's, it's um, a prayer from a little book called The Valley of Vision, which is an old set of prayers from Christians in the past. And he describes, I think, in this prayer, this, it describes, I think, the experience of constant repentance in the Christian life. And I can certainly relate to it. I don't know about you. Let me pray this to close. I am always running off to the far country and always returning home as a prodigal son. Always saying, Father, forgive me. And you are always bringing forth the best robe. Lord Jesus, every morning, let me wear it. Every evening, let me return in it. Let me go out to the day's work in it, be wound in death in it, stand before the great white throne in it, and to heaven in it, shining as the sun. And grant me never to lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the exceeding righteousness of salvation, 
the exceeding glory of Christ, the exceeding beauty of holiness, and the exceeding wonder of grace. Amen.